Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so yet one more meeting. Uh, and this is the not well as a reminder, this applies here. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the TMI BFF. Uh, uh, Vittorio entertaining us today. Uh, regarding the meeting next week, uh, I'm going to cancel that, that meeting. The team is not ready uh, for that meeting yet. And uh, as soon as the team is ready, we will be scheduling um, another uh, interim meeting to continue off to that one discussion. And so that's all I have here. Any questions, comments? Okay, I will then stop sharing and hand it to Vittorio. All right, thank you, Rifat. Yeah. Here is my beautiful, beautiful screen. That's a picture of uh, Fiji, which I miss very, very much. Whereas instead of this picture is courtesy of uh, your official uh, photographer of the identity word, Ryan Campbell. So today we're going to talk about the token mediating and session information backend for front end. In short, that's a mechanism for a, a JavaScript app, which happens to have a backend, not all of them have one for delegating to that backend, uh, the acquisition and management of access tokens, and uh, but retain the ability to make calls from JavaScript directly. And this is something that uh, lots of people already do. Uh, it's just uh, an attempt to uh, give some guidance so that uh, some of the most obvious security issues can be prevented and uh, interoperability can be achieved. Um, I don't have a lot of slides, but uh, I suspect that some of the questions will be answered by the slides. So my suggestion is uh, let me blubber for uh, as much as I need to blubber, and then we can open it to uh, discussion. Unless there is something like a burning question, then uh, by all means, don't burn, interrupt me. Okay, so we presented these a number of times. We already discussed these on the, um, on the mailing list, and there was one point that was hard for people to understand. So I'm clarifying it upfront. In the literature, when you talk about uh, BFF, a lot of people will in interpret it as uh, the backend does absolutely everything. So acquiring tokens and uh, acting as a reverse proxy for the calls. That is not the sense that we use it in here. Like not everyone has that uh, interpretation. We call that pattern for clarity full BFF. Whereas in here, we say, okay, you have a BFF when you have a backend, because again, it's not obvious that you have a backend, you might be a pure single page app that just orchestrates call to APIs on other domains. And you delegate some capability, some function to the backend. That's the sense in which we use the term here. And this spec does not describe a full BFF. These specs does not try to replace a full BFF. So here we are going to talk a bit, bit about like why we're going to do this, and then we're going to examine the main flow, which is ultra simple, and then we'll discuss. So reason one, whenever you can, you should not get tokens in the user agent. We know it's like a, not a good idea. The thing is that, uh, um, you, um, you, you are not always in a position of being able to. Let's say that uh, that switch um, topology, which you have uh, every user agent that performs a call to the API versus all the calls going through uh, your backend uh, has implications. Like uh, is, security is not the only consideration you should have in here. Uh, like if you have a backend, which uh, basically just serves you the page and then gets out of the way, then you are not going to spend a lot in AWS money. And uh, when uh, you have a browser and it's connected to an API, this API can be in the same region as the browser. Uh, so there are a number of considerations that go beyond sheer security that uh, can make people use uh, a different approach than uh, a reverse proxy full BFF, even when they do have a backend. And here, those are just a couple of possible reasons, but you just need to look at the market. 
people do that. It's just the way in which uh, people uh, solve this particular topology. The other side is, uh, okay, we have code plus pixie, so why bothering about this? And the thing is, uh, code plus pixie is very nice. I think then uh, our community did an excellent job in uh, proposing that as an alternative to implicit flow, uh, but it still remains pretty complicated. Let's say that uh, the typical experience of a front-end developer is not exactly to understand all the moving parts. And uh, we can uh, tone down the surface to the absolute minimum, like just give me your client ID, your redirect URI, the address of your provider, like just those three strings, but people still manage to screw it up. And uh, there are many moving parts and some things we simply cannot hide from the developer. Like if you are doing a refresh token rotation and you fail to get back a token, you find yourself stranded in no man's land and no amount of SDK can help you. And the other is that uh, we rely on capabilities that are not universally available. Now I won't name names, but uh, out there, they are extraordinarily um, popular and adopted SDKs that use code plus pixie and they use uh, normal refresh tokens without any rotation. So uh, it's great. And if you don't have a backend, it's pretty much your only choice, but there are like aspects that can be uh, improved. So one typical way that we see like one uh, uh, natural grassroots approach for people similar to people are using ID tokens for calling APIs, like uh, natural finds a way. And so you see people doing classic confidential flow, which are well understood, but are on the backend side, so less problems. And uh, they just willy nilly take the access token and make it available for their front end. And this thing has a number of challenges. They are writing custom code, which is uh, always uh, tough. Um, they find their own way of sharing tokens between their backend and the frontend, and it, it's not entirely trivial. So they have no, they don't have a benefit of a classic thing in which, uh, when we tell them here is how you do X, that thing is typically polished by multiple eyes and security experts that uh, give advice. Instead, they just invent it on their own. There is no threat model that the people can refer to, and uh, there is uh, no interval. That's to say that uh, um, every time you do this approach and you are not following any syntax, any particular guidance and similar, the code you produced cannot be just uh, reused across the board. So if uh, every time I build a new app, I have to build this thing again, or if I, have, uh, if I want to mix and match things like uh, React and Node uh, or React as uh, an ASP.NET, there is no way of uh, just reusing this stuff. So what we're trying to do here is to provide some guidance for solving this particular uh, issue in which we uh, describe how to do this, uh, exactly this pattern, but with a bit more of like that uh, we can establish so that uh, we can, we'll be able to achieve, um, oh, Nisaka say um, unmuted. Um, so okay. that we can achieve some interoperability and um, we can also enshrine uh, some security principles uh, so that uh, people are not completely on their own as they are today. And so we do this by adding a couple of endpoints that uh, the uh, application is supposed to expose, uh, specific messages and uh, um, security considerations, and also a way of getting session. I'll get to that in a second. So here is the main flow. You have a front end and the back end, and they are the same application. Here, I mention these because sometimes people think about uh, contracts between the two, but in fact, uh, you can expect those two things to be handled more or less by the same owner. And then you have the authorization server. Now, even before we do anything at all with a TMI BFF, you have to have a secure session, which means that the backend needs to act like a web app and the front end needs to use whatever the developer decides for signing in. These can be open and connected, these can be custom stuff, doesn't matter. As long as you end up with a session which you can then later leverage 
when you make calls with GMI. So you need a cookie to end up in your cookie jar. The second thing you need to do is to get whatever tokens you need that might require interactivity from the user. So imagine that in this first step, you might be doing uh, sign in and then a code flow in which you get the access tokens you need and the refresh tokens you need. Or you might have done a hybrid in which you signed in and got access token and refresh token on the back end at the same time. Doesn't matter. From our point of view, as long as you have a session and as long as you obtained the tokens you need, taking care of all the interaction, we are happy. And whatever way you want to do it. If here you want to have a debug stuff, if here you want to give back API keys instead of the tokens for users, for us, it doesn't matter. Just have your stuff ready on the back end. Then the main flow here is uh, you can see the front end with the cookie. You can see the back end, which exposes this uh, well known endpoint for tokens. And we do our request. Our request will carry the session because uh, we established that. And it will just ask for a token with the scope that we want, we have optionally the resource if we need a resource and the cookie which we have in here. And note that uh, the front end is not uh, declaring uh, any client ID, is not using, uh, like it's not using any configuration. Like the code which is running uh, on the front end is a pure boilerplate. There is nothing customized for this. The JavaScript developer can just bring it down and use it without configuring anything apart from the scopes that they want, of course. And here, actually, sorry, let me go back. Now the backend decides, the backend will uh, see the session, will see whatever they have. If they have an access token, which is still valid and cached, can return it. If they don't have it, and if they have a refresh token, they can use this refresh token. The front end knows nothing about it. The backend just decides whether they can send something back. And if they do, they send it back with a bunch of uh, um, extra headers, which we added thanks to the feedback we got from Neil. Thank you, Neil. Very useful. And here you get the access token, the scopes, which we provide and the expires in. Pretty standard. If we can't provide a token as requested without any interaction, at this point in time, we fail. We decided for Ocam Razor to do nothing about uh, recovery. We just fail with a specific set of errors that we defined. But uh, um, there is a lot of discussion about whether we should do something about it, and we could do something about it. But given it's an initial proposal, we didn't want to go too far. And then, of course, once you have a token, you can call the API. And note that here we don't make anything prescriptive about the front end. The front end wants to have a service worker that does all these up to them. It's like completely up to the specific implementation. Now, one problem you have in this process, like in this typical approach, is the cookie, which contains presumably the session information, is opaque to the front end. But the front end very often needs to show stuff about the, um, about the end user or like about the session. So we add a session endpoint where in the same way, which I can just make boilerplate request, and here this the uh, backend can just send you back whatever it thinks is information about the session. So here, the backend, like the classic thing that we probably are all thinking of, uh, because we are identity people, is uh, an ID token or the counterpart of the user info. But in fact, the uh, backend can give its point of view about what attributes are important, including, for example, mix and matching with local stuff. So here is uh, just a, me a mechanism for formalizing what endpoint to hit in order to get back this information. Once again, for interoperability purposes and similar. Okay, so why doing, why doing this? The JavaScript is really, really simple. It's like uh, absolutely trivial. There is no configuration, like a lot of the issues that we have uh, that people stumble upon go away. Um, adding the, the behaviors that I've shown in that flows in existing middlewares, like for example, stuff that already support uh, uh, OpenID Connect sign-in, it's super simple. Like those are just two basic endpoints that just expose things that are already done by that middleware. 
uh, the advantage of maintaining tokens on this uh, like on the, the user agent is that you can make calls directly in there. So if you have a very chatty scenarios, or if you have a really large number of users, or if the location of a user in respect of API is important, you retain that uh, uh, capability. And by the fact that we are using uh, all this flow on the service side, and we don't expose the refresh token to the front end, we don't need to use the same advanced measures that we devised for code plus pixie. And so you can just connect to old stuff, which don't have these advanced stuff. Like uh, ideally you don't even need cores for, the, for those endpoints and you can still provide uh, those capabilities. And in terms of interoperability, these can be super powerful because uh, again, two very simple endpoints to add on the middleware. So any middleware on any backend platform, Node, SP.NET, Java, and similar, and ultra easy JavaScript code for consuming those endpoints. So React, uh, Angular, uh, Vue, whatever, it's, it's Monday. I'm sure there is a, a new platform for this. And again, like imagine adding this code to a brand new JavaScript platform versus adding code plus Pixie. It's a different development effort. And the thing here is that uh, it's decoupled from the specifics of uh, how you authenticate and even how you get your tokens. So you can use it with pretty much anything. Like if you're already signing in uh, using uh, your own proprietary approach, or if you are getting tokens, not using the code flow on the server side, but you simply want, for example, to send back code that you got from the um, client, client credential flow, or like any other flow, like again, API keys, or test scenarios in which you want to test your app to call APIs, but you don't want to mock the authorization server, which is uh, often painful. But instead, with this mechanism, you just mock everything very, very simply, and so have a continuous integration, uh, in interactive tests, like all sorts of uh, development practices become very easy. For the ones among you who participated in the discussion, we made some changes uh, on the new draft. Uh, in particular, we added the security measures in the HTTP headers when we return the uh, access token. We, uh, um, we, I'll take responsibility. I went uh, overboard the first time and I made claims that perhaps I shouldn't have made in terms of security. So all those has been yanked. Uh, we clarified the point of uh, BFF versus full BFF. Um, we clarified that we'd like people to keep using full BFFs whenever they have a chance because it's more secure. Uh, we expanded on the prerequisites because people didn't understand uh, at first. And uh, we clarified the relationship with browser BCP, which is uh, we are not aiming at substituting anything we are just adding details to one scenario that the browser BCP hints at, but doesn't expand. Almost done. So here I'm going to take a very uh, strong stance that's for the purposes of uh, stimulating discussion. So I know this is pretty, uh, pretty far, far out. People are already doing this today, and they are doing it in a very cottage industry style, garden variety. So we have really two possibilities. One is uh, we look at these and we say, oh, wow, this is horrible, super dangerous. People should never do it. Then we articulate it in a way that people understands it, like uh, not arcane, but actually giving scenarios, like giving uh, concrete examples. And then just like we are campaigning against ROPG, we can start campaigning against this. And again, we need to find really solid reasons here. The other is uh, if instead uh, we find that this thing is not uh, blasphemy, but there is uh, uh, like it is something that can be done with some reasonable expectation of security, then I think that today just leaving the Fermat style, uh, this uh, margin is too small to contain the wonderful proof that I found for this theorem, it's like uh, leaving it as an exercise to the reader is not great because uh, again, people will do bad things like uh, uh, sending tokens with uh, bigger scopes uh, or, uh, I don't know, a, a number of things which uh, uh, we would find unsavory. And of course, there is also the interoperability matter. And then finally, like the, the, my main open issue is uh, whether we should handle the token acquisition case, but I think that uh, the discussion about this point is uh, more, 
foundational. And that said, I am Dan. Okay, thanks, Vittorio. Um, one second here. I just posted the link, so please, if you haven't added your name, please add your name to the list. And let's go to the queue here. Uh, Dick? Hey, Victoria. Great work. I love the idea of uh, standardizing this approach. A uh, couple of pieces of feedback. I did a quick uh, Google on BFF, which, of course, is best friends forever is the top link. <laughs> um, but then BFF for development does hit you know the design pattern where of what you call full BFF. And I'd suggest coming up with a different acronym for what you're doing to not confuse people. People already think of it being the full backend, and we're not going to be able to change the definition ourselves. And so maybe something, you know, back end for OAuth, put OAuth in the acronym perhaps to go and make it clear that that's what it is. Uh, my other feedback, I was uh, surprised to see dot well known being an API endpoint as opposed to a discovery endpoint and wondering if that's uh, becoming a common practice of using it as an API endpoint instead of for discovery. And then another thing on the dot well known, if we are going to do that, do we want to add more of a hierarchy that it's a dot well known slash OWASP slash EFF or something like that to make it clear that it's sort of part of the whole OWASP space. If we start to add other APIs, be easier to have them all in one namespace of OAuth as opposed to everything effectively being a big flat namespace of all the other things using well known. Thank you. Was that all uh, very um, was that all very good points? The uh, the BFF uh, has been something that we um, we suffered for, and uh, I have to admit that uh, Brian was uh, exactly the same uh, advice. So it's entirely my fault. And now it's like uh, it's uh, as Aaron uh, noted very recently. Uh, we are uh, like if you search for TMI BFF, which are both a very common acronym outside of our world, we gain the top spot on Google. So. Uh, we should think about renaming, but it's going to be painful because we are in such a good place. Um, on the web dot well known, honestly, I I have no preference at all. So I'll uh, I'll leave on uh, Brian to comment because uh, he's deeper he's than deeper. me on these. Um, thanks for deferring. I don't have a strong opinions either. Um, there does seem to be some general. Um, dislike for having functional API type stuff in dot well known, but to my knowledge, it's not actually precluded. It just seems to be a stylistic thing that folks don't like. Um, and I, I kind of went back and forth on exactly that, but ultimately it seemed kind of silly to have a discovery document for two endpoints versus just having two individual endpoints. Um, that said, it's sort of, it was like, a, I, I didn't have a super strong feeling one way or the other. It's just sort of where we landed and certainly up for, uh, up for change going forward if, if we adopt this. Um, as far as namespacing it, I, I'm under the understanding that you can't, that you're not allowed paths in the well-known registry, but I may very well be wrong on that. Um, some sort of name prefix, I, I suppose, could be used to to try to group things together. Um, that's a lot of rambling, but does that sort of touch on your opinions there? Yeah, no, I think if we maybe want to go and provide a rationale section, if we're doing some things that are new, um, I do worry about sort of this, the well known being a place that most places think is static or essentially configuration discovery information and not an API endpoint. Yeah, I do too. Um, do you, are you aware offhand whether that's an actual requirement or just sort of common expectation and convention? 
I did a quick skim through the well-known RFCs and I didn't see anything that said that. It said that how it's used is up to the application. Um, but, and so I don't see it, it being forbidden. I just think that many people are viewing that that's a discovery area and you're potentially changing how somebody has set up their infrastructure that suddenly now part of that space is an API. That's uh, maybe a, there's a way I forget where the other metadata endpoints are for OAuth, but maybe these two endpoints could just go into another an existing metadata file instead of creating a new one. Um yeah, the the thing is that really like this is this metadata is about an app itself, not an existing OAuth component. So I I think it really would deserve its own space um or or a distinct treatment but i i think the point you made about um you know potentially running afoul of other infrastructure or making it difficult to configure based on other content and things people are expecting in that location is a very um salient one and one we ought to consider um which might push us back towards just just a simple discovery mechanism um the thing about the discovery is that it's, of course, more flexible, but in my concrete experience, a lot of people use uh, defaults, as in uh, every different uh, uh, library, like Node, SPL.NET, and similar, have a default for some things like uh, direct URIs and similar, and then uh, all the guidance ends up uh, relying uh, on those defaults. And the intent in giving, like, uh, and I'm not married on the syntax, like uh, well-known or uh, anything else, doesn't matter, but I really like the simplicity of having something that comes out of the box so that you remove one of the uh, classic uh, error points that people have stumbles upon. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there, like, uh, if there is a possibility of collision, it's a problem. We thought that uh, just by adding dot well known, uh, the problem with the collision on an application would be lower, but uh, any thing yeah. would work. Then if we want to also add a mechanism for overriding the defaults, fine. But I really believe that having a default is a part of the appeal or the simplicity of the, of the approach. I, I think the the potential for conflict is avoided by using uh, well-known because there's an actual registry for that content. So you have to, you're either in violation of it or, or you have to register your stuff to avoid any sort of collision. Um, standardizing paths into application namespaces that are in a document like this is something that's not in well-known is something that the IESG is going to be really, really frowned on and probably couldn't move forward. Um, so we, we sort of, we, we sort of need to do something either say, you know, it's out of band and shared, which is awful or publish the information somehow and well known such that it it's either the applications themselves or a pointer to them. And I, I think this point about using well known other things using well known wasn't about collision so much as just the infrastructure that likely sits behind it is you might have your whole website running on the same domain as this app and have to have other information and in well known. Um, I, of course, it, I can't think of any right now, but any kind of well-known crap that might apply to your, your whole domain. Um, and then suddenly needing to be able to also have content in that path respond to API requests and gen generate dynamic con content might, might very well make routing and deployment of that stuff really difficult where it would otherwise be serving a static directory of files from that particular um, directory. And so if we if we made this more just discovery static files based, it, it likely would play nice, play nicer with various types of deployments. Not that the other couldn't be accomplished, but it could be a, a pain in the in the rear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the library can, you know, fetch that. It knows where the discovery is, fetches it, and then that gives deployments a lot more flexibility on where the endpoints actually are. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, at Amazon doing some of the supporting some of the things in dot well known was 
super hard to make happen because you know you're trying to go and get a new directory at you know a domain that's controlled by a completely different group and you know they, you know they get very cranky around things like that yeah ultimately if uh, the default is the discovery as opposed to the actual endpoints uh, from a point of view of a, a front end developer, it remains a not touch thing. Like they don't need to do anything. Is the the library itself that uh, upon waking up finds stuff out. So yeah, I'm yeah. fine with that as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great approach you guys have, as opposed to it being yet another out of band configuration that it it'll just work. Um, and that discovery point is going to it's just going to be called once, and then the back end the library is going to have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, insightful. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, hi, Aaron here. Uh, that was enjoyable watching that discussion play out, uh, mirroring my exact train of thoughts. So uh, not being able to speak since I wasn't yet called on, uh, I'm happy that resolved itself the way I was going to suggest. Um, I completely agree with Dick that that dot well known while it's not technically required that it is static is very often deployed in a static way. And on top of that, another example of a team of a place where that would not work would be if an application is running at a subdirectory where the team that manages the app only controls what's in that subdirectory and doesn't actually control the root of the domain because the root of the domain would be managed by a totally different team at the company and it would be significantly difficult to route a particular path of under dot well known over to that app so it's a much easier ask of the of the application team to say to the web team hey please host this one value at this url rather than do fancy tricks with routing through proxies so yeah the conclusion you came up with of metadata at the dot well known which allows flexible routing of the actual API endpoint solves all of that, uh, all those concerns. Um, I do have a couple other things I wanted to ask as well, though. Um, uh, first of all, you mentioned about Pixie. I wanted to give you a shortcut for just the justification that you described, which is uh, Pixie never intends to claim that it protects tokens at rest. It protects the delivery of tokens to the application. And that alone is enough justification that Pixie does not solve what you're trying to do here at all. So I don't even think you need to get into the, the details of the fact that Pixie is quote unquote complicated or has more moving parts. It just doesn't claim to solve the storing, storing tokens at rest. So it's not, not even a thing that would be considered uh, as a alternative to this pattern. Um, but I, Two questions. One, the session info endpoint, I I see what you're getting at there of retrieving info based on uh, about about the session. I'm I have questions about what the value of that actually is if it isn't actually more defined. So you said that the data, the response properties is completely up to the application. It seems like there's would be more value if it was actually more well defined in terms of like this is the same response as the user info endpoint or this is the same as a token introspection call or this is the contents of an id token whatever you wanted to say but leaving it completely up to the application um i just question why bother even specifying it at that point it seems like apps can just do that on their own um then so that, that's a good point. Let's say that uh, if you were to go farther than what we are aiming at here, which is uh, calling APIs, but you would say, for example, I want uh, the JavaScript uh, on the front end to already have uh, UI elements which represents users and similar, and so I want to know the attributes in advance so I can interrupt with this thing, then yeah, you would uh, having a fixed schema would, uh, would help. But as we were thinking about these, we thought that these would not necessarily be, um, okay, it might be too restrictive. Let's say that uh, here you can literally have uh, any website, like uh, here, let me make an example uh, from the past. Uh, 
Have you ever heard about Cloud, which is now dead? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, Cloud had like if its own sign-in, which was like entirely proprietary, and then it had uh, all these uh, other apps that uh, it was calling through off just for integrating uh, all the various uh, uh, social scores and similar. So it was a classic, I sign in using whatever I want, and then I just happened to do off on top of it. And off, not OpenID Connect. So if we were to give these to Cloud, and if we were to constrain them, into a schema, then uh, they would uh, uh, they would have a problem. That's to say that the things that are in the schema, they don't have it. But they might have something completely different, like, for example, their scores and stuff like that. So we felt that uh, leaving to the developer what is a user for them uh, was a part of the power of his approach, in which, like, uh, again, you can mix and match what you have locally versus what you got from identity provider. If you have an identity provider, you might sign in using local uh, uh, database as it was the case for cloud. So I do see the value, and maybe we can have uh, something like uh, in, this, in the notes or somewhere saying, hey, if you happen to use OpenID, here there is uh, a way in which you might do this, which basically is uh, send back uh, the content uh, of uh, user info or ID token with uh, attributes. But I think that if you would force everyone to follow a schema, then uh, we would be too restrictive. Like we would uh, limit the range of places where this uh, approach can be useful. Yeah, that makes yeah. some sense. I think that maybe maybe your suggestion of uh, if you are using OpenID Connect, then you should do it this way is a good balance between that because it seems like uh, if people already are coming at this with a common schema, or at least a minimum set of properties, which is what an ID token is, then that would be a good idea to just have more interop at that layer. And yeah, if you're not even in the realm of OpenID accounts, then trying to force your schema into OpenID Connect schema doesn't actually help you at all. Yeah. Um I, those are all excellent points, and thank you for bringing this thing up. I wanted to add one particular thought in this context. Uh, this endpoint comes useful also uh, besides the considerations. Uh, when you are actually um, having a scenario where you are not calling APIs outside of your domain, but you are only calling APIs on your backend. Is, this is the classic scenario in which in the, in the BCP we tell people don't use off uh, because there is no access token involved. You only use cookies. But one big problem that we have at runtime, like when my, when my customers do that, is like, okay, but normally when I actually do use code plus Pixie or uh, uh, implicit or similar, I have user information in the JavaScript. Whereas if I'm just using cookies, I don't. Formalizing these particular endpoint is a way of uh, giving to them what they need also in that particular scenario, in which uh, uh, if you are only using cookies and you needed to extract info from the backend, uh, you can do it in a way which is standardized and with uh, the discovery of endpoint, all the things that we said earlier. So it's one additional value of uh, having a recession info endpoint. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I have one last question. You mentioned that one of the benefits of having this document is to have a consistent or have a have a sort of shared knowledge around the security of this type of deployment. So along those lines, do you have a list in here of explicitly things developers should not do that this uh, instead is recommending you know an alternative to? Since you were you were worried about oh if we don't have this document, people are going to do X Y and Z things that are terrible. So are those things spelled out anywhere? So in the, in the draft, they were, you'll see in the, um, in the security considerations that there are some of them. Some of them are obvious for us, but less obvious for others, like uh, the app scoping, for example, as in uh, uh, your backend should not return tokens that have more scopes than the ones that uh, um, they were asked for, which might not be something that people would naturally do. But, Mostly things like uh, the bunch of headers that you see here, which were added after we got feedback from the list. 
as in uh, like you needed to put this stuff in there so that you uh, cover yourself from a cross uh, um, cross uh, and, uh, request forgery and similar, which I would personally not have added until Neil brought this up. So this is an example of things that uh, can uh, actually help people be more secure than uh, by when they um, develop on their own. Brian, you don't have to do a queue. You can interrupt me at any time. <laughs> <laughs> not sure what the protocol is here, pun intended. Um, I, I wanted to just jump in quickly on Aaron's point about the session info that I, I think you, you both have really valid points about the benefit of sort of tightening up what's there versus the benefit of keeping it completely open. Um, and I, I'm not sure I necessarily want to dismiss either yet, at least stay open to the possibility of, of maybe a middle ground where potentially we identify a very small subset of claims that would be highly recommended or required such that the front end could could reasonably count on them being there in all cases without any kind of customization or configuration so as to facilitate things like a you know log out button where there's a you are now logged in as and maybe that's a display name or a username or something that that an app could always count on coming back from the the session info to, to build out those kinds of basic UI components without any kind of configuration and without any sort of concern for what the actual backing mechanism is. Like there always be some notion of who you are, whether you did it via connect or a local login or whatever. And so there may be value in, in trying to add a little bit more structure or at least required content to that versus completely, completely wide open. So here was the yeah. middle ground proposal. Uh, instead of just having a, a super basic BFF session info get, what if we have a, a strict get and a loose get? In the strict, you get the schema that you just described. In the loose, you get whatever the developer wants, the backend developer wants. And then at that point, if you have one of those components, you just go through the strict one and you have all the guarantees you want. But if people don't want to support it, they don't support it. Uh, that's are you concerned about? Are you concerned about um, conflicts in the the property names of, if we were to combine the two? Because I think what Brian was suggesting was like, you know, you have a you have a minimum set that the app can rely on. Um, like display name is a good example where that's not an open ID connect claim, um, but. Yeah. Uh, the thing I'm thinking is that is like twofold. One is uh, I had so many problems just to map uh, the the various uh, providers. Like I remember SP.NET developers, which were moving from ADFS to Azure AD to um, uh, Identity Server, and they had like uh, the same concepts with slightly different names, or sometimes one was there, some other wasn't there. So finding that core that works with everyone. I think is going to be uh, challenging on one side. On the other, I'm worried about the dennis of the world, which uh, are concerned about privacy. And so say that uh, one particular backend decides that the only thing you get is uh, a uh, unique identifier, which you can use for, I don't know, your favorite color, which you have uh, in local storage. But so again, I see the value of having that schema. I'm not confident that we can get to a schema which is truly universal and doesn't burden uh, people into doing things that are unnatural for their app, which is why to me supporting both would be a good way out without uh, uh, like getting the advantages of both without uh, taking a hit. Okay, guys, we, we have 10 minutes and we have two people in the queue. So is there any further discussion on this topic or should we take it offline like that? I'm let's, I'm done. Yeah, let's take it offline for okay. future. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Torsten. Thank you, Torsten, yes, but come. A um, couple of questions. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to understand what, what um, attacks 
the proposed service would prevent and which it does not. As far as I understand, uh, you leave or you um, <sighs> the refresh token is no longer stored in the, in, in the browser. It's instead kept bind to a cookie in the, in the backend. So you, you keep the, the refresh token out of the browser, but the access token is still accessible in the browser. Which means all kinds of attacks around access token leakage, replay, and so on are still uh, not covered. Is that a fair assessment? Or uh, please, please uh, comment on that. It is a fair assessment. Let's say that uh, now the access token is uh, one of the things that you can access when you can uh, use uh, the session cookie. So. Arguably, uh, here you can extract the access token if you manage to attack the system. If you were to do in a, a system in which you don't make the access token available to the front end, but you are uh, uh, facading all the calls to the APIs, you could technically use the same attack to call the APIs directly. So you don't need to have the access token to make that call. So this thing does uh, cannot prevent on its own the uh, cross site threat, like uh, the, all the attacks that normally leverage your cookie, but uh, it uh, relies on the same checks that you would do in this, uh, uh, in this situation. So it doesn't prevent those attacks in itself. You need to have uh, whatever measures you are normally using for mitigating those attacks in place. Yeah, I mean, you could extract the access token and replace some someplace else. That's, that's I think, is the difference. Um, okay, second question. Um, how do you detect and handle um, revoked access tokens? I mean, you, you said that uh, when the when the front end requests a new access token with a certain scope, then the back end will check whether it still has an access token that is that is valid. I assume by checking the expiration that the access token uh, sent with the token response. What happens if this access token was revoked by the uh, authorization server? What component does realize that and 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 recover from that? Our situation. Um, that would all be on the backend. Let's say that uh, it, it's the backend that is uh, responsible for making those checks. Although, uh, like, imagine that this is uh, all done by a web app, and uh, imagine that the calls are happening from the web app. All the same scenario apply if we just happen to be making these uh, available for a different uh, mode of call. So imagine that the front end is like the component that in no normally you'd be using for making API calls in your backend. These just happen to be executing elsewhere. So all the consideration apply for the uh, confidential clients that you would apply normally here. Sorry, I don't understand. I mean, yeah. The front uses an access token and, and receives a 403, for example, or 401 from the from the API that the access token is no longer valid. Um, does it have a, 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 some way to communicate it to the backend? Because the backend does not call an, a resource. So how how is right. the backend uh, supposed to determine that an access token is no longer valid? Right. Yeah. No, we don't um, we don't address that particular scenario right now. Like there is nothing that uh, we do from the uh, from the front end to signal to the uh, to the back end. Uh, please give me and uh, like this one is not good. Give me another access token or here there is uh, the challenge that I got from the API. Do something about it. We don't have anything. On the okay, then I think that's it, it makes a lot of sense to to spend some time to think about that because otherwise I think. The front end is running in a loop. I mean, if it's got the 401, it will most likely request a new access token from the back end. But if the back end just provides the same access token again, then it's, it's looping. So I think that that's that's worth a, a consideration. Uh, yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Let me ask you in a, a follow up question. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you want to API returned and uh, send it back to the end, or would you rather have uh, um, a flag of some kind so that uh, when the front end asks for the token, it can say and uh, give me a fresh one <laughs> as opposed to a fresh one. It's an excellent question, Vittorio. Um, I tend towards providing the backend with, with the response from the resource server, but that's just intuition. I think we, we should discuss that on the list. 
What's the best okay, way? Great. And, and I mean, if you have customers that 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 have deployed that 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 model, would be worth talking to them what they do in that situations. And with that, I, I suspect that uh, the people that are using these uh, flow are very unsophisticated. So, um, given that the developer owns both the front end and the back end, I suspect that they just like throw a bomb and uh, redo it from scratch. But uh, yeah, I, I'll find, I'll try to find out, and we can definitely uh, dig deeper yeah. in the list. I mean, basically, the, the, the simple, the simple solution would to have, would have an, another parameter. Uh, fresh access token, something like that, right? Or reset access token. But that, yeah, that would be the simple solution. And, um, but the more sophisticated would, would allow the backend to, to, to apply some logic on the response. So, yeah. And, and with that, I would give back to give other people uh, a chance to, to ask questions. Thanks, Thorsten. I appreciate that. Uh, Philip. Thank you. Philip Skok on Zero. I'll try to make this really quick because I don't want to beat a dead horse on well known. Um, but, um, adding to to Aaron's point, it sometimes is not possible in certain you know multi-tenant environments to control what is written by well-known at all. Um, so in that case, would you consider um, a fallback where when well-known is not available, the location for those endpoints is returned in the main body of the HTML, such as in a head tag, um, in a head meta tag, sometimes you know something which is used commonly to um, to tell JavaScript, hey, here is a CSRF token, for instance, we could put the location of um, of those endpoints into a meta tag. What was that question to a specific person? Was Just it? wondering if, if that is on the table or whether we're going to stick with, with well-known, whether we want to take it on the list, I don't know. Philip, would that be a, a head tag in the response to from the resource server, is that what you're suggesting? No, it would be it would be rendered with the page on which your front end application is actually running. So this would be you know the head tag of the HTML that you actually receive. It would be your index HTML. Oh, I see. Instance. Yeah. And from I, the, I, from I consider, the application I consider, that the back end serves. That's right. That's right. And I considered all the possibilities of you know somebody maliciously writing that head tag, but at the same time I could just you know. Through through JavaScript, overwrite the XHR prototype and make an interceptor for well known as well. So I don't think there is, you know, benefits to one or the other. But for scenarios where I can't control well known, a fallback would be great. Nick, do you wanna say a word on what do you what do you put there in the in the chat? Well, I just think that's a great idea to be able to have something in the actual document that's got all the links to the app that, you know, you tell the app where to go. Um, to me, any mechanism works. The main uh, um, constraints are they should be easy to uh, package into SDKs. Uh, if we were to say, place these meta tags uh, in uh, a page, we'd have to say specifically what is the page, and similar, or if we can inject it from the SDK, even better. I'm not familiar with this particular uh, method, so we can discuss it in the list as long as the packageability remains and as long as there is no ambiguity so that uh, we don't risk that one implementer choose uh, one way and uh, one backend, and uh, if another implementer of a front end SDK choose a different way and then they don't talk to each other. Then, as long as we can prevent that scenario, I'm happy with any mechanism. I have no opinion. Take it to the list then. Okay, um, I think we're almost done here. So, um, great discussions, and I see a lot of interest in this document. So, um, I, I want to get the feeling of of, of this uh, of the people here. Uh, are we ready to adopt this as a as a weak rule document? Is there interest in pursuing this problem? Okay, Dick, last one. Others? Not yet. One, okay. Others? 
<laughs> yeah, besides the authors, right? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, I see. I see lots of things. I'll take it then to the list and call for adoption for this document and take it from there. Okay. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. A reminder: next week we don't have a meeting. I'm going to cancel it, and we will schedule a follow up on or two the one after that. Have a nice day, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Bye.